नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू आई एस एस एफ संवाद संवाद इज अ प्लेटफॉर्म वेर वी इन्वाइट दी बेस्ट एंड दी ब्राइटेस्ट माइंड टू डिस्कस एंड डेलिब्रेट ऑन टॉपिक्स रिलेटेड टू इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन एंड जियो पॉलिटिक्स ऑन टूडेज एपिसोड वी आर डिस्कसिंग द इम्पोर्टेंट रीजन ऑफ सेंट्रल एशिया टू डिस्कस दिस इशू वी हैव मिस्टर निरंजन मार जानी ही इज अड पॉलिटिकल कंसल्टेंट एंड अ जियो स्ट्रेटेजिस्ट मिस्टर मार जानी ही इज अ फेलो एट द कलिंगा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडो पैसिफिक स्टडीज and he is also the consulting editor at the kootniti espanol sir namaskar what an honor it is for us to have you on our show thank you so much for joining thank you udayan for inviting me uh, for this uh, discussion for for samvad and for taking this uh, important topic of central asia which is uh, strategically and economically important not uh, just for the region but also for uh, extra regional powers so thanks again i am happy to discuss this subject with you so the honor is all us sir. and sir before we move ahead and uh, uh, we delve deeper into this conflict sir i like your initial analysis on this issue because uh, if you'll see sir uh, with the war in ukraine uh, russia is fast losing uh, its allies and uh, for uh, for the major part of the last three decades central asia was considered russia's backyard even uh, even before mr putin and during mr Put- uh, putin's tenure so uh, if you will see sir uh, just a few days back the tajik president sir he had openly demanded respect from uh, russia so that was actually a big statement considering that uh, uh, tajikistan and uzbekistan and all, all all the central asian countries they were considered basically a vassal of russia so do you think uh, these are early signs of dissidents and do you think that uh, russia is nervous when it comes to central asia uh let me start by just uh, briefly mentioning about the importance of central asia see uh, central asia as a region and even uh, since historical times it has been a very important region strategically because if we see it was a part of the ancient silk route and also it was a theater for the great game between russia and britain in 19th century until uh, early 20th century uh, after that of course it became a part of the soviet union and even after disintegration of uh, the soviet union uh, central asian countries uh, continue to be closely associated with russia and uh, like you mentioned uh, yes uh, it is cons- uh, it has been considered as russia's sphere of influence all along in these three decades and uh yes this russia ukraine war is uh, set to change the dynamics of the region and uh, all these central asian countries of course to varying degrees not uh, all of them uh, uh, equally but still they are showing signs uh, they are trying to uh, you know assert their independence to certain extent and to move away from russia and to look for other options uh, for engagement at regional and also global level so uh yes uh, the russia ukraine war has we can say started that process where uh, central asian countries are looking to exercise uh, their freedom and to move away from russia of course uh, there are number of reasons for that and uh, i think we'll discuss those as the discuss, uh, as our interview progresses uh, but uh, the two uh, incidents you mentioned these are certainly signs of which uh, about the tajik president i'll uh, deal with in detail when we talk about tajikistan because there are a uh, number of other factors also involved when it comes to tajikistan uh, very uh, uh, some particular factors related to ethnicity and also about uh, disputes uh, with its neighbors but uh, yes uh, i would say now the central asian countries because uh, if we just uh, Uh, consider central asian countries foreign policy then it has always been described as a multi vector foreign policy multi vectoral which means that uh, they have made attempts to uh, engage with different powers on equal basis and not to be aligned with any one power uh, so they have uh, tried to engage with uh, china uh, U- european union us and of course also with india but uh, it's true despite their efforts Uh, russia has maintained dominance in the region for the past three decades but uh, now i think we will see uh, russia would not be able to maintain that hold and other powers may actually gain foothold which uh, they have already started but i think now we'll see more of that 
and uh, diminishing of Russia's influence in the region. Right, sir. Uh, sir, over the email when we were sir, leading up to this episode, we were talking. Uh, sir, you mentioned about the identity factor playing a major role uh, in in this in this region. So, if you see, sir, uh, uh, Tajikistan, sir, it, they are basically ethnically Persian. Uh, from Persian background and uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and even Kazakhstan, so they share uh, Turkic uh, uh, genetics. So, do you think, sir, because of this uh, ethnic factor, this genetic factor, uh, Turkey, Iran, and uh, China, although, sir, they are not uh, uh, ge geographic geographically connected to the region, but sir, they still uh, play a major role uh, when it comes to uh, the politics and the uh, geo strategy of this region. Uh, yes, they do play a major role and particularly if we talk about the Turkic countries like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, then uh, yes, Turkey has been playing uh, a major role uh, since long time and actually when these countries became independent after disintegration of the Soviet Union, uh, Turkey, has, uh, Turkey immediately started engagements with all these Turkic origin countries and uh, also, since 2009, Turkey uh, established organization of uh, Turkic uh, states where uh, these uh, Central Asian countries and along with Turkey and Azerbaijan, they are members and they hold conferences every year. So the ethnicity factor does matter and Turkey is using this uh, ethnicity factor to uh, increase its outreach and to increase its influence among the Central Asian countries. Now, there is another factor in this uh, strategic geopolitical factor also involved. Uh, that is, uh, Turkey also is positioning itself uh, as an alternative to Russia when it comes to Central Asian countries and particularly when it comes to, uh, since uh, almost all the Central Asian countries, they uh, do not have access to sea or seaports. So, Turkey is uh, trying to, uh, you know, give these countries an option to uh, conduct their foreign trade through Turkey uh, using Turkey's ports. So Turkey is uh, also uh, trying to gain an economic foothold by, uh, you know, competing with Russia and also to uh, take this country out of uh, Russia's sphere. So uh, along with ethnicity factor, Turkey has major strategic and economic interests in Central Asian countries because, uh, you know, this is. Uh, uh, not unique. We have seen this from Turkey, uh, like it balances, it tries to uh, balance it, uh, its relations with uh, both uh, like US and also with Russia, which we saw during this Russia-Ukraine war as well, where it has tried to mediate between both the countries on certain occasions. And uh, let us also remember that Turkey is a member of NATO, but at the same time, it also wants uh, close relations with uh, Russia. So Turkey has been uh, playing this role. So same is the case with Central Asian countries where it is using the ethnicity factor to uh, benefit strategically and economically and to have more uh, clout in the region. So that has been happening. Besides, Turkey is also, uh, it has established uh, certain uh, institutions uh, to create awareness about the Turkic culture. So it is involved uh, in both, we can say, hard power and soft power uh, uh, soft power policies it is following in uh, Central Asian countries. So uh, that is about uh, Turkey. Uh, China, of course, China has been uh, uh, gaining foothold in Central Asia since uh, past about 15, 16 years uh, when it started investing and when it uh, really uh, started overtaking Russia in terms of trade and uh, other in investments. And also let us, uh, uh, if we remember in 2013, when Chinese President Xi Jinping launched his flagship project, the Belt and Road Initiative. He chose Kazakhstan to launch this project. So that much uh, how China values Central Asia. And since then, I mean, uh, China has constructed uh, railways, uh, some highways, and also the gas pipelines. So all these projects, so China and also China has long surpassed Russia as uh, Central Asia's major trading partner because uh, the trade between Russia and Central Asia now is nowhere, uh, nowhere near to trade between China and Central Asia. So China now is a major economic partner for Central Asian countries, also uh, involved in uh, defense and security cooperation. 
so and as it is uh, we know russia's uh, uh, economic uh, situation and uh, even strategic situation uh, is not that strong at the moment and uh, clearly even between russia and china if we see then china uh, is a senior partner if we can say uh, with uh, russia and uh, russia uh, because see china is russia's largest trading partner but russia is uh, not even among uh, top 10 trading partners of china so that much how china's clout is in the region and even uh, with russia so uh, i th think china is going to be a major power in this region and like we mentioned in the beginning uh, russia losing influence then it's only because now uh, china is gaining foothold and russia is uh, not exactly in a position to challenge china's economic and even uh, strategic uh, strength so that is about uh, china and central asian countries and about tajikistan yes uh, tajikistan they tajik people belong to persian ethnicity and uh, that way uh, iran has close connections with tajikistan but uh, what also happens is, is that uh, somehow uh, the ethnic problems they uh, surface and that uh, and that leads to tajikistan sitting uncomfortably among the central asian countries that has been the issue because it tries to project its persian culture and persian heritage and uh, ethnicity and uh, it doesn't really match with the turkic ethnic uh, central asian countries so the ethnic issue is an important issue among all the central asian countries uh, particularly uh, the turkic and persian ethnicity because tajik language is also uh, comes from persian language uh, whereas we see other languages like uzbek and kazakh i mean they uh, they resemble more to turkish uh, language so this linguistic and ethnic uh, differences uh, these are fault lines although they, at times they may not appear but uh, yes uh, these do exist uh, among the central asian countries and uh, that's why they uh, do create differences and disputes between them so yes these three factors are important uh, when we consider central asia's uh, foreign policy or we can say the strategic importance economic importance every country it tries to influence uh, the region according to uh, their own uh, strategic and economic interests using identity as a major factor right sir uh, sir, I'll just take a follow-up question from what we had discussed just now. Uh, so you had mentioned about China's role uh, in this region. And uh, if you'll see, sir, Russia, sir, it is a legacy player. It, it, is, it was the largest uh, republic in the uh, Soviet Union. And it was basically guiding these, uh, these uh, Central Asian republics when they were part of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union broke up, sir, then also for, I think, for the last three decades, Russia has been, been the go-to partner for these countries, pr providing not only military uh, support, not, on, not only economic support, but also political guidance to the leaders of this region. Now, sir, here comes China. So China experiences a, a new economic, a new level of economic growth, and it starts expanding its uh, horizons. And, and uh, sir, it starts... Uh, budging into uh, Russia's sphere of influence because uh, Russia, uh, Russia, if if we'll see, sir, it considers Central Asia as sort of an untouchable no-go zone, uh, and China is budging in. So, uh, do you think that Russia will allow China to be be the number one player in this region, considering the fact uh, the historical reasons? And uh, one more thing, sir, uh, uh, some of the uh, geo strategists they mentioned that. Russia actually invited India into the Shanghai Co uh, Cooperation Organization to thwart uh, Ch uh, China's uh, Ch uh, China's rise in the Central Asian region. So, do you think that this holds true? This argument holds true. See, as to the question as to uh, if Russia would allow China to increase its influence, then I think at the moment uh, Russia doesn't have any choice of allowing or not allowing a particular country uh, to you know engage with uh, central asia or for that matter any other country or region uh, with which uh, russia has had uh, strong ties because uh, russia like i said is not in a position to challenge china at the moment and between china and russia now russia is the junior partner and china 
uh, is a major power. So, uh, and also another thing, this Russia, because of this Russia-Ukraine war, uh, Russia is increasingly getting isolated in the world because uh, many countries are turning against Russia and it doesn't have many uh, partners or close friends at the moment. So, China is one country that has supported Russia all along since the start of this uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, so I think uh, Russia would not do anything that would upset China at the moment, uh, since it would need support, uh, otherwise it would uh, get isolated. And yeah. like uh, about Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it, it is also said that uh, like Russia invited India to thwart China's influence, but then uh, China also put condition of uh, admitting Pakistan as a member. Mm -hmm. And only when that was agreed upon, both India and Pakistan became members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, so, uh, in India's case, of course, uh, India saw it as an opportunity to engage more with uh, Central Asia rather than, uh, you know, uh, get into disputes with China and Pakistan, but uh, uh, Russia, like Russia, would need partners at the moment, and China is Russia's major partner and supporter. So, uh, Russia, even if it doesn't like uh, China's influence in its uh, backyard or sphere of influence, uh, right now it uh, would not uh, be able to do anything about it. It cannot up upset China. And uh, so that's the reason China, and that is not, I mean, China has been economically stronger than Russia for a number of uh, years or number of decades. China has built up its uh, economy and now it's trying to uh, spread its influence in different parts of the world through BRI or even through any other bilateral engagements. And uh, China also needs uh, Central Asia's energy resources for its uh, growing economy. And it's not likely to, uh, you know, cede any space to Russia or for that matter, any power. And already it has made inroads, like, uh, you know, forget this war and uh, isolation of Russia at the moment. But China has been engaging uh, with uh, Central Asia since 2005 in all these projects, I mean, all these uh, gas pipeline connectivity projects, even before the BRI, China had started uh, planning its engagements with Central Asia with a view to gain access to all the energy resources. So uh, it's not that uh, Russia was not aware, but uh, at the same time, China has became, become a competitor, not just for India or uh, other Western countries, but also for Russia. Uh, just that because uh, China is supporting Russia, Russia would not uh, do anything uh, that would uh, you know, strain its relations with China at the moment, at least at, least at the moment. Right, sir. I think, sir, we had uh, comprehensively covered the identity factor and, and uh, the uh, initial analysis that we were talking about. I think now it, it, is, it is time to pick one country at a time and discuss uh, them in detail. I think, sir, uh, I'll start with the largest country that is Kazakhstan. Uh, for, yes. for the past uh, three years, Kazakhstan ha had been a stable, uh, stable country, both polit uh, both as a uh, political power and as an ally of Russia. Uh, uh, then, sir, uh, its uh, president, sir, which uh, he was uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, sir, he was president since the breakup of the Soviet Union, and sir, he steps down. Uh, he is uh, he is felicitated. Uh, the capital names is name is Astana's name is changed to Nur Sultan, and all all sorts of crying is going on within the political uh, leader that they have lost a father. After that, after Nur Sultan uh, steps down, uh, we had sir uh, one of the largest protests that Kazakhstan has saw in its thirty year history. Uh, Russia had to be Russian troops had to be called in. They had to uh, they had to resort to violence. They had to resort to high handedness. After that, uh, uh, President Tokayev, uh, the, the successor of uh, President uh, Nazarbayev, he, uh, he uh, actually, uh, he uh, delists, he, uh, he throws uh, President Nazarbayev from the Security Council, which he was heading. Yes. And, and sir, uh, now, uh, which, uh, now we will see that uh, the name of Nur Sultan has been again changed back to Astana. So, uh, and... Uh, also, sir, uh, if we look at the uh, Ukraine and Russia crisis and uh, uh, Russia, uh, the, the Kazakh, Kazakh leadership, they had said that they, they are not going to send troops or any aid to Russia 
in its fight against Ukraine. So do you think that uh, Kazakhstan is finally uh, moving away from the clutches of Russia and towards a more independent uh, stance, considering the fact that uh, the, if you look at the statements of the, of the leadership uh, that is coming, coming, coming from Kazakhstan? So uh, your analysis on this, sir? Kazakhstan certainly is uh, trying to uh, break away from Russia's influence, although, uh, you know, it won't be easy and it, it would take a long time if it really has to follow an independent foreign policy or really to come out of uh, Russia's influence. Uh, yes, the current president has been taking some steps and uh, it looks like he wants to uh, follow and he wants to really implement the multi-vector foreign policy for his country, particularly uh, in terms of economic and even uh, strategic domains. Now, if we consider uh, Kazakhstan or for that matter, even uh, other Central Asian countries, then uh, they are still uh, heavily dependent on Russia for uh, their economic means, for economic cooperation, because a uh, number of uh, uh, Central Asian migrant workers, they work in Russia and uh, they send remittances back home. Although this has been disrupted due to the Russia-Ukraine war and many uh, workers had to come back and uh, the remittances have dropped uh, significantly in the past seven or eight months. But uh, still, uh, in terms of trade, in terms of uh, raw material, the Central Asian countries are still dependent on two-way trade. Uh, Russia is one of their major trading partners and also for getting raw material and energy supplies, uh, food grain supplies. So they are uh, very much, uh, Russia and Central Asian countries are still interdependent. Uh, it won't be easy for them to just, uh, you know, uh, break from all these uh, policies and all this uh, dependence and to look for new options. They would have to uh, develop and engage with other countries and have to develop options over the next few years. So that is how the economic uh, dependence factor and also strategically, uh, President Tokayo did say that now he will try and build his independent military and not depend on Russia. Uh, although he had to uh, call, uh, he had to get Russia's help and Russia sent him Russian troops as well as troops from uh, CSTO, Collective Security Treaty Organization, to uh, control all those protests that started in January. Uh, but uh, again, then Kazakhstan would have to develop independent military of its own. And so the dependence on economic and uh, economically and strategically on Russia is uh, right now too much. And uh, the Central Asian countries would really have to start from now on if they have to uh, reduce their dependence. And it's uh, also for practical means because uh, like we are discussing, Russia's economic position is not very strong. Uh, it may not be able to engage with all the Central Asian countries at the level that it has been engaging for the past three decades, which affects Central Asian countries' economies severely because of their dependence on one country. So for that reason as well, they would have to look for options. And even strategically, uh, there, there are apprehensions as to uh, whether they would meet the same fate as Ukraine because uh, all those Central Asian countries, they have a significant Russian population, although in minority, but still significant. If we consider Kazakhstan, then it has around 25% population of Russian origin. And uh, Central Asian countries may actually uh, argue that uh, Russia might because of his, uh, because of irredentism, irredentist claims, uh, Central Asian countries might also actually uh, face the same consequences that Ukraine did. Because uh, in Ukraine, there are different narratives as to why Russia is at war. Uh, and one of them is, of course, uh, the areas which are under Russia's control, they have a Russian majority population. And uh, Central Asian countries could put forward that argument as a fear that Russia might attack them next. Although uh, I don't know if it would actually happen considering the strain on Russia's economy and the military forces. But uh, still, it's a valid fear on the part of uh, Central Asian countries. And, you know, 
a former Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, he had tweeted about Kazakhstan being an artificial country, although he deleted this tweet later, but still that also created some discomfort in Kazakhstan and which uh, led to uh, the present president uh, taking some, uh, actually projecting himself as an independent leader and giving hints as to Kazakhstan would try and move away from Russia and follow an independent policy. Because uh, in terms of economy also, he said that uh, those companies which are leaving Russia, they could invest in Kazakhstan and he would offer them uh, investment, uh, investment opportunities and to do business in Kazakhstan to strengthen its economy. So yes, uh, there are signs, uh, there are concerns uh, in Kazakhstan and also uh, in other countries as to Russia's intentions and considering the more practical way whether Russia, Russia could be a depend uh, could be a country on which they could depend uh, because uh, because of economic reasons and strategic reasons so uh, number there is a number of factors and combination of all these factors why Kazakhstan and also other Central Asian countries they are thinking of uh, following an independent policy and coming out of Russia's influence. Right. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for that analysis on the Kazakh issue. Uh, sir, uh, before we move on to the Tajik and the Kyrgyz uh, border clashes, uh, I just wanted to know your opinion on the uh, matter that uh, there are some circles, uh, the strategic circles who are saying that uh, President Tokayev is actually upset uh, with uh, Russia and he suspects that uh, the January protest was actually uh, was actually a hand uh, between uh, president, former President Nazarbayev and Russia to topple his government? Or do you think the Western powers were involved uh, in the January protest? Sir, your views on this? Uh, well, there are different narratives as to these protests. And uh, also, in addition to this, one of uh, the narratives is that uh, the protest basically started because uh, President uh, hiked fuel prices. And uh, but uh, during uh, in the course of this protest, they were uh, hijacked by some criminal and terrorist elements, uh, which is why uh, military assistance had to be called from Russia and the CSTO. Uh, and uh, despite uh, uh, you know he, uh, uh, I mean, despite he uh, took back his decision to uh, raise the fuel prices, the protests continued thereafter, and violence continued thereafter which uh, gives a uh, suspicion that uh, uh, terrorists were involved in this and particularly because uh, you know for the past few years there has been rise in radicalization in uh, Kazakhstan and uh, across all the Central Asian countries uh, uh, that's why this uh, there is actually some uh, reason to believe that it may be possible that uh, terrorists and particularly you know after the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, the situation in Central Asia and uh, across the region, it is much more vulnerable and uh, radicalization and uh, Islamic terrorism, I mean, the spreading of all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, terror activities across the borders, uh, it is uh, very much uh, possible. So I think uh, that is also one of the reasons. and. Of course, these protests and all this uh, military assistance from Russia, it took place before the Russia-Ukraine war. And uh, what we saw uh, President Tokayev taking steps is uh, after the war started and after he actually, uh, you know, uh, formulating policies to move away from Russia. And also, like you mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, he removed uh, in, uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev from the National Security Council and he also removed certain other officials who were in the position of authority who were uh, close to Nazarbayev or he, they were his relatives and he also removed his prime minister after uh, this protest. So he made a number of changes. Uh, this must be this, uh, there are internal political tussle between him and Nazarbayev uh, like he changed the name of the capital from Nur Sultan to Astana. Uh, so I think uh, there are a number of narratives of uh, Western countries involved and also the terrorist elements taking over all these protests. But uh, in any case, uh, uh, it has raised security concerns 
in kazakhstan and across the region and like i mentioned before uh, the reasons are both uh, strategic as well as uh, economic of moving away from russia uh, maybe like you said it it could have been a conspiracy but on more practical terms it's uh, whether kazakhstan and other countries can depend on russia like they used to for the past 3 decades since uh, russia cannot provide them the same uh, economic assistance uh, like it used to and for a sphere of influence uh, they need uh, all these economic assistance although they are dependent but they are slowly trying to explore other options and uh, to engage with other countries more if uh, they have to move away from russia so that would be my uh for me my assessment is more it has got to got more to do with the security concerns arising out of uh, radicalization and particularly the taliban takeover of afghanistan so uh that remains a major concern for all the countries right sir i think sir we have comprehensively covered the kazakh uh, issue so now i think uh, it is time to move on to the tajik kyrgyz crisis Uh, sir, uh, in the past month, sir, we have been getting these news that uh, t- the Tajik and Kyrgyz border, sir, it has got hot, and uh, there are uh, there are also news of uh, massive casualties from both sides, and there are also news that Tajikistan has actually captured few villages in inside Kyrgyzstan. So, uh, how do you see see this uh, conflict? Do you think uh, this is uh, like uh, repressed Tajik nationalism because? uh the tajik what the tajik nationalism says is that uh, they have been treated very unfairly over the past centuries uh if we look sir uh, in uzbekistan sir uh, 40 or 30 40% of uzbekistan was actually historically belonging to tajikistan the ancient city of samarkand the tajik nationalist they claim that samarkand was our uh, our uh, city and it was given to uzbekistan Uh, even sir uh, uh, in uzbekistan also there are a good chunk of population who are ethnically tajik uh, so to and but uh, there are also counter views that uh, this is the ego project of uh, president imomali Ima, uh, rahman uh, because sir uh, there are r- rumors that he is going to step down and he is going to uh, hand over the reins to his son uh, very soon so so how do you see this uh, belligerent position of tajikistan do you think this is tajik repressed tajik nationalism or do you think this is mere politics by uh, the president of tajikistan see uh, tajik nationalism is one of the factors but uh, the conflict between tajikistan and kyrgyzstan that we saw in the last month uh, it is also a result of uh, Uh, you know a legacy it's a legacy of the soviet era because uh, after soviet disintegration and when these uh, all these five countries came into existence the borders were not uh, delimited uh, delimited uh, and not uh, demarcated properly and that is one of the reasons why uh, we are seeing border conflicts very often see this is not the first time that uh, tajikistan and kyrgyzstan have engaged in a border conflict they it has been going on for past 3 decades and according to one estimate uh, the past 10 years has seen uh, 150 border conflicts between both the countries so uh, this has been going on uh, Ta- tajikistan and kyrgyzstan they share about 1000 km of border and almost half of it is not demarcated properly so it's about a, uh, claims on the land territory and also it has uh, an economic angle to uh, this uh, border conflict uh, the conflict also happens because of uh, sharing of resources because since uh, uh, during even the soviet era uh, it was agreed upon that these countries would share uh, land resources water resources and even uh, you know grazing rights for the livestock so uh, these disputes have not been settled since then and even after uh, these countries came into existence as independent nations uh, these uh, disputes have remained there has been no clear demarcation of all these uh, borders and also of all these resources as to who will share how much uh, resource uh, as to land and water so this has been a major uh, issue because uh, you know many times conflicts have taken place not just between uh, the soldiers of both side but even between the locals uh, about as to 
use of the land and sharing of uh, water resources so it is it is an uh, old conflict going on for three decades and uh, if you talk about nationalism then uh, uh, yes it is one of the factors that uh, comes up during border conflict because like tajiks are persians and kyrgyz people are of turkic origin so that factor does happen also after uh, tajikistan came into existence in 1991 uh, for uh, from 1992 to 1997 the country witnessed a civil war and in that uh, civil war as well the nationalism factor was a prominent factor although uh, the president later said that all uh, all the ethnicities uh, living in tajikistan they are tajik nationals with uh, no discrimination but still uh, the civil war also saw divide between tajik and uzbek people because a sizable uzbek population lives in tajikistan and uh, yes tajik nationalism did play its part and tajikistan also uh, celebrating its uh, culture and heritage uh, that also creates discomfort among all the turkic ethnic uh, countries of central asia and i would also like to mention a statement by tajik president during the recent russia central asia uh, summit where he said uh, that uh, we are not a part of soviet union anymore and that uh, russia must respect us and further he said russia must also respect our customs and traditions every country is unique and every country has its own problems and customs and traditions so uh, he was not just demanding respect uh, from russia uh, as an independent country as a president of an independent country but then it also has the undertones of uh, this uh, nationalism and this uh, ethnic uh, tensions we can say between tajikistan and other central asian countries so i think uh, nationalism does play its role but uh, the border conflict is also much more than nationalism it also has to do with sharing of these uh, economic resources between both the countries which are not clearly defined even after three decades so uh, i think uh, to end this conflict both the countries and if they allow then some mediation from other countries or international institutions has to take place uh, otherwise uh, i mean it would continue Uh, as long as the borders are not demarcated and uh, as long as the sharing of resources is not agreed upon right sir sir i think uh, we have uh, covered all the aspects of uh, the central asian issue that uh, this region has been facing so i think uh, it is now time to move on to our final question and uh, uh, being an indian sir uh, uh, i think this is the most important question for us Uh, so uh, how do you see the uh, india and the central asian uh, relationship because uh, one for one sir uh, our engagement with central asia is uh, is marred by the geographical handicaps that are present because uh, if we'll see sir pakistan and afghanistan they are uh, playing sort of a, a spoil sport in realizing the full potential of an indian india central asia relationship so uh, if you'll see sir the tapi uh, projects uh, we had plans to bring uh, oil and gas from uh, uh, turkmenistan and that got uh, rattled because of pakistan's belligerent stand uh, so similarly sir a lot of uh, issues prop up because of the presence of uh, these two hostile countries uh, that is pakistan and now sir with the presence of taliban we can say afghanistan is also playing a sort of a handicap for us so uh, how how do you think that india should approach Uh, central asia going into the uh, this decade and how how do you see how do you analyze the overall dynamics of the india central asia relationship uh, well uh, you are absolutely right when you mention uh, about the handicaps that uh, india has faced with uh, uh, its relations with central asia uh, geography and uh, connectivity is a major factor but still i would say uh india has done well despite of all these impediments uh, when uh, it has uh, chosen to uh, you know uh, search for an alternate connectivity route through iran so uh, india recognizes in uh, importance of central asia strategically and economically and uh, it is true that geography because of geography the relations between india and the region have been dormant for most part of the past three decades but uh, now uh, we can see for past about one decade or seven eight years the relations are gaining momentum 
despite all these uh, issues that exist uh, with uh, Pakistan's belligerence and also now uh, Taliban in power in Afghanistan, the relations are going forward. Uh, and I think uh, like Prime Minister Modi visited all the five Central Asian countries in 2015. And uh, after that, uh, the engagements have been taking place uh, fairly regularly. And uh, recently, a high profile visit was by uh, former President Ramnath Kovin to Turkmenistan in April. So I think uh, India Central Asia relations are moving forward. Of course, uh, there is a lot to be done. India has to cover a lot of ground when it comes to Central Asia because uh, we are actually uh, behind China and Russia in terms of uh, investment and trade. Uh, if I am correct, then India's overall trade with uh, combined trade with all the Central Asian countries, it comes to around $2 billion, uh, which is nowhere near uh, China's uh, trade with Central Asia or Russia's trade with Central Asia. So India really has to work on that. And uh, I think with uh, the way all these connectivity projects are gaining momentum, uh, we would see trade increase in next few years because uh, right now we saw a trial run of uh, International North-South Transit Corridor, INSTC, and also Chabahar Port, uh, India has been working on that. And several Central Asian countries, and particularly Uzbekistan, has uh, shown interest in uh, developing Chabahar Port since uh, it needs access to sea. Uh, all these countries, they need access to sea. Now, uh, what I feel is that uh, if we consider Central Asia, then we need to consider one uh, element from India's foreign policy point of view, uh, there have been uh, serious challenges to India's outreach to Central Asia. But uh, I believe uh, India has uh, created opportunities out of these challenges. Like, uh, for example, if we consider past two, three years, then uh, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has been a major challenge for all the countries, but uh, still India uh, created an opportunity in the form of uh, sending medical supplies and vaccine diplomacy. So India has a lot of goodwill across a uh, number of countries and India also sent vaccines to Central Asian countries. So India has that uh, goodwill. India has come across as a reliable partner for Central Asian. And uh, considering the present situation where uh, Central Asia is looking to come out of Russia's influence, then India is an ideal option for them to increase their engagements uh, from their side. Because, uh, you know, although China has increased its clout in the region by way of, uh, you know, investments and all these economic projects, uh, but there is a, uh, but there is discomfort among the people of Central Asia, not so much among the uh, political uh, ruling dispensation, but uh, the people of Central Asia, they are uh, not very happy with China's involvement uh, and China's growing influence in the region. Uh, in that case, uh, India could step in and India could offer them an alternative in terms of uh, investments and also uh, co uh, strategic cooperation. Uh, and India has to uh, taken steps in that direction as well, because we saw in uh, November last year, uh, India convened a summit wherein uh, it invited all the Central Asian countries to discuss about the situation in Afghanistan. Because, uh, uh, like I mentioned before, the growing uh, radicalization is a threat to the entire region and to India as well. So, India would need to engage with the Central Asian countries to, uh, you know, control this radicalization and uh, cooperate on anti terrorism mechanisms. So in that uh, sense also, because you know, uh, Central Asian countries, uh, radicalization was not a very major factor because they uh, considered their identities, ethnic identities, they put ethnic identities over their religion for a number of years. But now with growing uh, terrorism in Pakistan and Afghanistan, it has been spreading to Central Asia as well. So uh, India would need even more cooperation with uh, all these countries and like it uh, engaged with those countries uh, on Afghanistan. So uh, further, uh, you know, engagements and high level visits are necessary to take these uh, ties forward.
so that i think uh, india india has a lot of stakes in that region because india considers central asia as its uh, extended neighborhood uh, and uh, i think we will see uh, a greater involvement from india in the coming years uh, that's what my assessment is right sir i think sir we had touched upon all the major issues concerning the central asian region and uh, i think it is time for us to wrap up our discussion and uh, i'll not be lying if i'll say I, i i am absolutely mesmerized by your depth of knowledge on this issue and uh, during our conversation lots of my own doubt got cleared uh, when i put up the question to you and sir after listening to you uh, lots of my own doubt got cleared so thank you so much for that and uh, uh, during the past 10 15 days sir we were getting a lot of questions from our uh, audience and from our readers about central asia so i was just telling them that you wait for some time we have something uh, special for you coming up and that will clear all your doubt and sir i think that uh, today's discussion uh, will clear the doubts of all our readers and uh, so thank you so much for that sir and thank you so much for agreeing to come come to our platform thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, the questions were very good they were sharp and uh, so i thank you for putting uh, such questions and i hope uh, the viewers and also the readers of issf they find this interview useful uh, and i it was a pleasure to discuss this uh, issue with you absolute pleasure uh, thanks again to you and to the entire team of issf for inviting me right sir i think sir uh, uh, with your uh, article on the multi vector uh, foreign policy and this discussion i don't think any of our readers they need to go anywhere else when it comes to the central asian issues so thank you so much for that and thank you so much for coming to sambad sir thank you so much sir namaste oh, thank you thank you for inviting me and for your kind words thank you thank you so much sir